Environmental sociology is the study of interactions between societies and their natural environments. The field emphasizes the social factors that influence environmental resource management and cause environmental issues, the processes by which these environmental problems are socially constructed and defined as social issues, and societal responses to these problems. Environmental sociology emerged as a subfield of sociology in the late 1970s in response to the emergence of the environmental movement in the 1960s. Topic definition Environmental sociology is typically defined as the sociological study of societal environmental interactions, although this definition immediately presents the problem of integrating human cultures with the rest of the environment. Although the focus of the field is the relationship between society and environment in general, environmental sociologists typically place special emphasis on studying the social factors that cause environmental problems, the societal impacts of those problems, and efforts to solve the problems. In addition, considerable attention is paid to the social processes by which certain environmental conditions become socially defined as problems. Topic history Ancient Greeks idealized life in nature using the idea of the pastoral. Much later, Romantic writers such as Wordsworth took their inspiration from nature. Modern thought surrounding human-environment relations can be traced back to Charles Darwin. Darwin's concept of natural selection suggested that certain social characteristics played a key role in the survivability of groups in the natural environment. Although typically taken at the micro level, evolutionary principles, particularly adaptability, serve as a microcosm of human ecology. Work by Craig Humphrey and Frederick Buttle 2002 traces the linkages between Darwin's work on natural selection, human ecological sociology, and environmental sociology. Sociology developed as a scholarly discipline in the mid and late 19th and early 20th centuries, in a context where biological determinism had failed to fully explain key features of social change, including the evolving relationship between humans and their natural environments. In its foundational years, classical sociology thus saw social and cultural factors as the dominant, if not exclusive, cause of social and cultural conditions. This lens downplayed interactive factors in the relationship between humans and their biophysical environments. Environmental sociology emerged as a coherent subfield of inquiry after the environmental movement of the 1960s and early 1970s. The works of William R. Catton Jr. and Riley Dunlap, among others, challenged the constricted anthropocentrism of classical sociology. In the late 1970s, they called for a new holistic, or systems perspective. Since the 1970s, general sociology has noticeably transformed to include environmental forces in social explanations. Environmental sociology has now solidified as a respected, interdisciplinary field of study in academia. Topic concepts Topic Existential dualism The duality of the human condition rests with cultural uniqueness and evolutionary traits. From one perspective, humans are embedded in the ecosphere and co-evolved alongside other species. Humans share the same basic ecological dependencies as other inhabitants of nature. From the other perspectives, humans are distinguished from other species because of their innovative as capacities, distinct cultures and varied institutions. Human creations have the power to independently manipulate, destroy, and transcend the limits of the natural environment Buttle and Humphrey, 2002, p. and NBSP, 47. According to Buttle 2005, there are five basic epistemologies in environmental sociology kindly mention them. In practice, this means five different theories of what to blame for environmental degradation, i.e., what to research or consider as important. In order of their invention, these ideas of what to blame build on each other and thus contradict each other. Neo-Malthusianism Works such as Hardin's The Tragedy of the Commons 1968 reformulated Malthusian thought about abstract population increases causing famines into a model of individual selfishness at larger scales causing degradation of common pool resources such as the air, water, the oceans, or general environmental conditions. Hardin offered privatization of resources or government regulation as solutions to environmental degradation caused by tragedy of the commons conditions. Many other sociologists shared this view of solutions well into the 1970s see Ophels. There have been many critiques of this view particularly political scientist Eleanor Ostrom, or economists Amartya Sen and Esther Bozarup. 
Even though much of mainstream journalism considers Malthusianism the only view of environmentalism, most sociologists would disagree with Malthusianism since social organizational issues of environmental degradation are more demonstrated to cause environmental problems than abstract population or selfishness per se. For examples of this critique, Ostrom in her book Governing the Commons, The Evolution of Institutions for Collective Action 1990, argues that instead of self-interest always causing degradation, it can sometimes motivate people to take care of their common property resources. To do this they must change the basic organizational rules of resource use. Her research provides evidence for sustainable resource management systems, around common pool resources that have lasted for centuries in some areas of the world. Amartya Sen argues in his book Poverty and Famines, an essay on entitlement and deprivation 1980, that population expansion fails to cause famines or degradation as Malthusians or Neo-Malthusians argue. Instead, in documented cases a lack of political entitlement to resources that exist in abundance, causes famines in some populations. He documents how famines can occur even in the midst of plenty or in the context of low populations. He argues that famines and environmental degradation would only occur in non-functioning democracies or unrepresentative states. Esther Bozerup argues in her book The Conditions of Agricultural Growth, The Economics of Agrarian Change Under Population Pressure 1965, from inductive, empirical case analysis that Malthus's more deductive conception of a presumed one-to-one -one relationship with agricultural scale and population is actually reversed. Instead of agricultural technology and scale determining and limiting population as Malthus attempted to argue, Bozerup argued the world is full of cases of the direct opposite, that population changes and expands agricultural methods. Eco-Marxist scholar Alan Schneiberg below argues against Malthusianism with the rationale that under larger capitalist economies, human degradation moved from localized, population-based degradation to organizationally caused degradation of capitalist political economies to blame. He gives the example of the organized degradation of rainforest areas which states and capitalists push people off the land before it is degraded by organizational means. Thus, many authors are critical of Malthusianism, from sociologists Schneiberg to economists Sen and Bozerup, to political scientists Ostrom, and all focus on how a country's social organization of its extraction can degrade the environment independent of abstract population. New ecological paradigm In the 1970s, the new ecological paradigm NEP conception critiqued the claimed lack of human environmental focus in the classical sociologists and the sociological priorities their followers created. This was critiqued as the human exceptionalism paradigm HEP. The HEP viewpoint claims that human environmental relationships were unimportant sociologically because humans are exempt from environmental forces via cultural change. This view was shaped by the leading Western worldview of the time and the desire for sociology to establish itself as an independent discipline against the then popular racist biological environmental determinism where environment was all. In this HEP view, human dominance was felt to be justified by the uniqueness of culture, argued to be more adaptable than biological traits. Furthermore, culture also has the capacity to accumulate and innovate, making it capable of solving all natural problems. Therefore, as humans were not conceived of as governed by natural conditions, they were felt to have complete control of their own destiny. Any potential limitation posed by the natural world was felt to be surpassed using human ingenuity. Research proceeded accordingly without environmental analysis. In the 1970s, sociological scholars Riley Dunlap and William R. Catton Jr. began recognizing the limits of what would be termed the human exemptionalism paradigm. Catton and Dunlap 1978 suggested a new perspective that took environmental variables into full account. They coined a new theoretical outlook for sociology, the new ecological paradigm, with assumptions contrary to HEP. The NEP recognizes the innovative capacity of humans, but says that humans are still ecologically interdependent as with other species. The NEP notes the power of social and cultural forces but does not profess social determinism. Instead, humans are impacted by the cause, effect, and feedback loops of ecosystems. The Earth has a finite level of natural resources and waste repositories. Thus, the biophysical environment can impose constraints on human activity. 
They discussed a few harbingers of this NEP in hybridized theorizing about topics that were neither exclusively social nor environmental explanations of environmental conditions. It was additionally a critique of Malthusian views of the 1960s and 1970s. Dunlap and Catton's work immediately received a critique from Buttle who argued to the contrary that classical sociological foundations could be found for environmental sociology, particularly in Weber's work on ancient agrarian civilizations, and Durkheim's view of the division of labor as built on a material premise of specialization, specialization in response to material scarcity. This environmental aspect of Durkheim has been discussed by Schneiberg 1971 as well. Eco-Marxism In the middle of the HEP-NEP debate, the general trend of neo-Marxism was occurring. There was cross-pollination. Neo-Marxism was based on the collapse of the widespread believability of the Marxist social movement in the failed revolts of the 1960s and the rise of many new social movements that failed to fit in many Marxist analytic frameworks of conflict sociology. Sociologists entered the fray with empirical research on these novel social conflicts. Neo-Marxism's stress on the relative autonomy of the state from capital control instead of it being only a reflection of economic determinism of class conflict yielded this novel theoretical viewpoint in the 1970s. Neo-Marxist ideas of conflict sociology were applied to capital, state, labor, environmental conflicts instead of only labor, capital, state conflicts over production. Therefore, some sociologists wanted to stretch Marxist ideas of social conflict to analyze environmental social movements from this materialist framework instead of interpreting environmental movements as a more cultural, new social movement, separate than material concerns. So, eco-Marxism was based on using neo-Marxist conflict sociology concepts of the relative autonomy of the state applied to environmental conflict. Two people following this school were James O'Connor, The Fiscal Crisis of the State, 1971, and later Alan Schneiberg. Later, a different trend developed in eco-Marxism via the attention brought to the importance of metabolic analysis in Marx's thought by John Bellamy Foster. Contrary to previous assumptions that classical theorists in sociology all had fallen within a human exemptionalist paradigm, Foster argued that Marx's materialism led him to theorize labor as the metabolic process between humanity and the rest of nature. In Promethean interpretations of Marx that Foster critiques, there was an assumption his analysis was very similar to the anthropocentric views critiqued by early environmental sociologists. Instead, Foster argued Marx himself was concerned about the metabolic rift generated by capitalist society's social metabolism, particularly in industrial agriculture. Marx had identified an irreparable rift in the interdependent process of social metabolism created by capitalist agriculture that was destroying the productivity of the land and creating wastes in urban sites that failed to be reintegrated into the land and thus lead toward destruction of urban workers' health simultaneously. Reviewing the contribution of this thread of eco-Marxism to current environmental sociology, Pello and Brem conclude, "...the metabolic rift is a productive development in the field because it connects current research to classical theory and links sociology with an interdisciplinary array of scientific literatures focused on ecosystem dynamics." Foster emphasized that his argument presupposed the "...magisterial work," of Paul Burkett, who had developed a closely related red-green perspective rooted in a direct examination of Marx's value theory. Burkitt and Foster proceeded to write a number of articles together on Marx's ecological conceptions, reflecting their shared perspective more recently. Jason W. Moore, inspired by Burkitt's value analytical approach to Marx's ecology and arguing that Foster's work did not in itself go far enough, has sought to integrate the notion of metabolic rift with world systems theory, incorporating Marxian value related conceptions. For more, the modern world system is a capitalist world ecology, joining the accumulation of capital, the pursuit of power, and the production of nature in dialectical unity. Central to Moore's perspective is a philosophical re-reading of Marx's value theory, through which abstract social labor and abstract social nature are dialectically bound. Moore argues that the emergent law of value, from the 16th century, was evident in the extraordinary shift in the scale, scope, and speed of environmental change. What took premodern civilization centuries to achieve—such as the deforestation of Europe in the medieval era— 
capitalism realized in mere decades. This world historical rupture, argues Moore, can be explained through a law of value that regards labor productivity as the decisive metric of wealth and power in the modern world. From this standpoint, the genius of capitalist development has been to appropriate uncommodified natures, including uncommodified human natures, as a means of advancing labor productivity in the commodity system. Topic. Societal environmental dialectic in 1975, the highly influential work of Alan Schneiberg transfigured environmental sociology, proposing a societal environmental dialectic, though within the neo -Marxist framework of the relative autonomy of the state as well. This conflictual concept has overwhelming political salience. First, the economic synthesis states that the desire for economic expansion will prevail over ecological concerns. Policy will decide to maximize immediate economic growth at the expense of environmental disruption. Secondly, the managed scarcity synthesis concludes that governments will attempt to control only the most dire of environmental problems to prevent health and economic disasters. This will give the appearance that governments act more environmentally consciously than they really do. Third, the ecological synthesis generates a hypothetical case where environmental degradation is so severe that political forces would respond with sustainable policies. The driving factor would be economic damage caused by environmental degradation. The economic engine would be based on renewable resources at this point. Production and consumption methods would adhere to sustainability regulations. These conflict-based syntheses have several potential outcomes. One is that the most powerful economic and political forces will preserve the status quo and bolster their dominance. Historically, this is the most common occurrence. Another potential outcome is for contending powerful parties to fall into a stalemate. Lastly, tumultuous social events may result that redistribute economic and political resources. Topic. Treadmill of production In 1980, the highly influential work of Alan Schneiberg entitled The Environment, From Surplus to Scarcity 1980 was a large contribution to this theme of a societal environmental dialectic. Moving away from economic reductionism like other neo-Marxists, Schneiberg called for an analysis of how certain projects of political capitalism encouraged environmental degradation instead of all capitalism per se. This ongoing trend in Marxism of neo-Marxist analysis meaning, including the relative autonomy of the state here added the environmental conditions of abstract additions and withdrawals from the environment as social policies instead of naturalized contexts. Schneiberg's political capitalism, otherwise known as the treadmill of production, is a model of conflict as well as cooperation between three abstracted groups, the state, capital exclusively monopoly capital with its larger fixed costs and thus larger pressures for ongoing expansion of profits to justify more fixed costs, and organized labor. He analyzes only the United States at length, though sees such a treadmill of production and of environmental degradation in operation in the Soviet Union or socialist countries as well. The desire for economic expansion was found to be a common political ground for all three contentious groups in capital, labor, and the state to surmount their separate interests and postpone conflict by all agreeing on economic growth. Therefore, grounds for a political alliance emerge among these conflictual actors when monopoly capitalism can convince both of the other nodes to support its politicized consolidation. This can appeal to the other nodes since it additionally provides expanding state legitimacy and its own funding while providing, at least at the time, secure worker employment in larger industries with their desired stable or growing consumption. This political capitalism works against smaller scale capitalism or other uses of the state or against other alliances of labor. Schneiberg called the acceleration of the treadmill this degradative political support for monopoly capitalism's expansion. This acceleration he felt was at root merely an informal alliance, based solely on the propaganda from monopoly capital and the state that worker consumption can only be achieved through further capitalist consolidation. However, Schneiberg felt that environmental damage caused by state political and labor-supported capitalist expansion may cause a decline both in the state's funding as well as worker livelihood. This provides grounds for both to reject their treadmill alliance with monopoly capital. This would mean severing organized labor support and state policy support of monopoly capital's desires of consolidation. 
Schneiberg is motivated to optimism by this potential if states and labor movements can be educated to the environmental and livelihood dangers in the long run of any support of monopoly capital. This potentially means these two groups moving away from subsidizing and supporting the degradation of the environment. Schneiberg pins his hopes for environmental improvement on deceleration of the treadmill. How mounting environmental degradation might yield a breakdown in the acceleration-based treadmill alliance. This deceleration was defined as state and working labor movements designing policies to shrink the scale of the economy as a solution to environmental degradation and their own consumptive requirements. Meanwhile, in the interim, he argued a common alliance between the three is responsible for why they prefer to support common economic growth as a common way to avoid their open conflicts despite mounting environmental costs for the state as well as for laborers due to environmental disruption. Topic. Ecological modernization and reflexive modernization By the 1980s, a critique of eco-Marxism was in the offing, given empirical data from countries mostly in Western Europe like the Netherlands, Western Germany and somewhat the United Kingdom that were attempting to wed environmental protection with economic growth instead of seeing them as separate. This was done through both state and capital restructuring. Major proponents of this school of research are Arthur P. J. Mole and Gert Spargerin. Popular examples of ecological modernization would be cradle to cradle. Production cycles, industrial ecology, large-scale organic agriculture, biomimicry, permaculture, agroecology and certain strands of sustainable development. All implying that economic growth is possible if that growth is well organized with the environment in mind. Reflexive modernization. The many volumes of the German sociologist Ulrich Beck first argued from the late 1980s that our risk society is potentially being transformed by the environmental social movements of the world into structural change without rejecting the benefits of modernization and industrialization. This is leading to a form of reflexive modernization with a world of reduced risk and better modernization process in economics, politics, and scientific practices as they are made less beholden to a cycle of protecting risk from correction which he calls our state's organized irresponsibility. Politics creates eco-disasters, then claims responsibility in an accident, yet nothing remains corrected because it challenges the very structure of the operation of the economy and the private dominance of development, for example. Beck's idea of a reflexive modernization looks forward to how our ecological and social crises in the late 20th century are leading toward transformations of the whole political and economic systems institutions, making them more rational with ecology in mind. Topic. Social construction of the environment Additionally in the 1980s, with the rise of postmodernism in the Western Academy and the appreciation of discourse as a form of power, some sociologists turned to analyzing environmental claims as a form of social construction more than a material requirement. Proponents of this school include John A. Hannigan, particularly in Environmental Sociology, a Social Constructionist Perspective 1995. Hannigan argues for a soft constructionism environmental problems are materially real though they require social construction to be noticed over a hard constructionism the claim that environmental problems are entirely social constructs. Although there was sometimes acrimonious debate between the constructivist and realist camps within environmental sociology in the 1990s, the two sides have found considerable common ground as both increasingly accept that while most environmental problems have a material reality they nonetheless become known only via human processes such as scientific knowledge, activists' efforts, and media attention. In other words, most environmental problems have a real ontological status despite our knowledge, awareness of them stemming from social processes, processes by which various conditions are constructed as problems by scientists, activists, media and other social actors. Correspondingly, environmental problems must all be understood via social processes, despite any material basis they may have external to humans. This interactiveness is now broadly accepted, but many aspects of the debate continue in contemporary research in the field. Events Modern environmentalism United States 
The 1960s built strong cultural momentum for environmental causes, giving birth to the modern environmental movement and large questioning in sociologists interested in analyzing the movement. Widespread green consciousness moved vertically within society, resulting in a series of policy changes across many states in the U.S. and Europe in the 1970s. In the United States, this period was known as the «environmental decade» with the creation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency and passing of the Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, and amendments to the Clean Air Act. Earth Day of 1970, celebrated by millions of participants, represented the modern age of environmental thought. The environmental movement continued with incidences such as Love Canal. Topic. Historical studies. While the current mode of thought expressed in environmental sociology was not prevalent until the 1970s, its application is now used in analysis of ancient peoples. Societies including Easter Island, the Anasi, and the Mayans were argued to have ended abruptly, largely due to poor environmental management. This has been challenged in later work however as the exclusive cause biologically trained Jared Diamond's collapse 2005, or more modern work on Easter Island. The collapse of the Mayans sent a historic message that even advanced cultures are vulnerable to ecological suicide. Though Diamond argues now it was less of a suicide than an environmental climate change that led to a lack of an ability to adapt. And a lack of elite willingness to adapt even when faced with the signs much earlier of nearing ecological problems. At the same time, societal successes for Diamond included New Guinea and Tikopia Island whose inhabitants have lived sustainably for 46,000 years. John Dreisach et al. argue in Green States and Social Movements, Environmentalism in the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, and Norway 2003 that there may be a common global green environmental social movement, though its specific outcomes are nationalist, falling into four ideal types of interaction between environmental movements and state power. They use as their case studies environmental social movements and state interaction from Norway, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Germany. They analyze the past 30 years of environmentalism and the different outcomes that the Green Movement has taken in different state contexts and cultures. Recently and roughly in temporal order below, much longer-term comparative historical studies of environmental degradation are found by sociologists. There are two general trends, many employ world systems theory. Analyzing environmental issues over long periods of time and space, and others employ comparative historical methods. Some utilize both methods simultaneously, sometimes without reference to world systems theory like Whitaker, see below. Stephen G. Bunker D. 2005, and Paul S. Chikantel collaborated on two books from a world systems theory view, following commodity chains through history of the modern world system, charting the changing importance of space, time, and scale of extraction and how these variables influenced the shape and location of the main nodes of the world economy over the past 500 years. Their view of the world was grounded in extraction economies and the politics of different states that seek to dominate the world's resources and each other through gaining hegemonic control of major resources or restructuring global flows in them to benefit their locations. The three-volume work of environmental world systems theory by Singh C. Chu analyzed how nature and culture interact over long periods of time, starting with world ecological degradation 2001. in later books, Chu argued that there were three dark ages in world environmental history characterized by periods of state collapse and reorientation in the world economy associated with more localist frameworks of community economy and identity coming to dominate the nature culture relationships after state facilitated environmental destruction delegitimized other forms thus recreated communities were founded in these so-called dark ages novel religions were popularized and perhaps most importantly to him the environment had several centuries to recover from previous destruction chu argues that modern green politics and bioregionalism is the start of a similar movement of the present day potentially leading to wholesale system transformation therefore we may be on the edge of yet another global dark age which is bright instead of dark on many levels since he argues for human community returning with environmental healing as empires collapse. More case-oriented studies were conducted by historical environmental sociologist Mark D. Whitaker analyzing China, Japan, and Europe over 2,500 years in his book Ecological Revolution 2009. 
He argued that instead of environmental movements being new social movements peculiar to current societies, environmental movements are very old, being expressed via religious movements in the past or in the present like in ecotheology that begin to focus on material concerns of health, local ecology, and economic protest against state policy and its extractions. He argues past or present is very similar, that we have participated with a tragic common civilizational process of environmental degradation, economic consolidation, and lack of political representation for many millennia which has predictable outcomes. He argues that a form of bioregionalism, the bioregional state, is required to deal with political corruption in present or in past societies connected to environmental degradation. After looking at the world history of environmental degradation from very different methods, both sociologists Sing Chu and Mark D. Whitaker came to similar conclusions and are proponents of different forms of bioregionalism. Topic related journals Among the key journals in this field are, Environmental Sociology Human Ecology Human Ecology Review Nature and Culture Organization and Environment Population and Environment Rural Sociology Society and Natural Resources Topic See also Topic Notes Topic References Buttle, Frederick H. and Craig R. Humphrey, 2002. Sociological Theory and the Natural Environment, pp. 33-69 in Handbook of Environmental Sociology edited by Riley E. Dunlap and William Michelson, Westport, C.T., Greenwood Press. Diamond, Jared, 2005 Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. New York, Viking. ISBN 0-670-03337-5. Dunlap, Riley E., Frederick H. Buttle, Peter Dickens, and August J. Shvay, eds. 2002. Sociological Theory and the Environment, Classical Foundations, Contemporary Insights Roman and Littlefield, ISBN 0-7425-0186-8. Dunlap, Riley E., and William Michelson, eds. 2002, Handbook of Environmental Sociology Greenwood Press, ISBN 0-313-26808-8 Freudenberg, William R., and Robert Gramling, 1989. The Emergence of Environmental Sociology, Contributions of Riley E. Dunlap and William R. Catton, Jr., Sociological Inquiry 59 4, 439-452 Harper, Charles, 2004. Environment and Society, Human Perspectives on Environmental Issues. Upper Saddle River, New Jersey, Pearson Education, Inc. ISBN 0-13-111341-0 Humphrey, Craig R., and Frederick H. Buttle, 1982, Environment, Energy, and Society. Belmont, California, Wadsworth Publishing Company. ISBN 0-534-00964-6 Humphrey, Craig R., Tammy L. Lewis and Frederick H. Buttle, 2002. Environment, Energy and Society, A New Synthesis. Belmont, California, Wadsworth, Thompson Learning. ISBN 0-534-57955-8 Meta, Michael, and Eric Aulet, 1995. Environmental Sociology, Theory and Practice, Toronto, Captus Press. Redcliffe, Michael, and Graham Woodgate, eds. 1997, International Handbook of Environmental Sociology Edgar Elgar, 1997, ISBN 1-84064-243-2 Schneiberg, Allen, 1980. The Environment, From Surplus to Scarcity. New York, Oxford University Press. Available, https colon slash slash web dot archive dot org slash web slash two oh oh eight oh eight two eight two oh four three five oh slash http colon slash slash media dot northwestern dot edu slash sociology slash schneiberg slash one five four three oh two nine underscore environment society slash index dot html Topic Further reading Hannigan, John. Environmental Sociology. Routledge, 2014. Zenner, Ozzy, Green Illusions, University of Nebraska Press, 2012. An environmental sociology text forming a critique of energy production and green consumerism. Foster, John Bellamy, Brett Clark, and Richard York, The Ecological Rift, Capitalism's War on the Earth, Monthly Review Press, 2011. Sociological consideration of ecosystem collapse. Metzner Sigev, A. 2009. Contradictory Approaches? 
on realism and constructivism in the social sciences research on risk, technology and the environment." Futures, Vol. 41, No. 2, March 2009, pp. 156–170 Full Text Journal, 1 Free Preprint, 2. White, Robert, Controversies in Environmental Sociology, Cambridge University Press, 2004. Overview of Topics in Environmental Sociology Topic external links ASA Section on Environment and Technology ESA Environment and Society Research Network ESA Research Committee on Environment and Society RC24 Society and Environment, Professional Association Society and Environment, Scholarly Journals Canadian Sociological Association CSA Environment Research Cluster